Six days ago, I got to post a video about the fine work that people like K2DMG is doing out on the N2GE repeater, helping people in the disaster area after Hurricane Helene, even those that were unlicensed, right? Because this is an emergency situation with people in an area that's actively destroyed, and they're doing a fantastic job. Oh, do you read me? Can I heard and do you read me? And yes, I do, but uh, you're breaking out very bad. Go ahead and give it a shot. The uh, uh, Walgreens Pharmacy is... Uh open at this hour uh, besides the one in Toronto Road. I think that they're not open. Okay, is anybody in the affected area around Asheville, which is going to be the east side of Asheville, so this gentleman is on Tunnel Road, which I believe is up off of 240, if I remember correctly. But, um, come now if you have any information at a pharmacy. I do know there's a pharmacy in Weaverville. A Weaverville pharmacy is available, but is there anything else in uh, the east side of Asheville for this gentleman come down? That we go to the Weaverville one. Thank you much. Okay, unfortunately, I didn't copy a lot of that. You're breaking in and out real bad, but uh, uh, no problem. You said thank you, so I think you may have figured something out. Uh, there is a one in Weaverville on Main Street. If you can make it to Weaverville, Weaverville streets are open per their fire chief yesterday. Then later, I saw this video from S2 Underground, who I watch often, and we've communicated tangentially through comments on some videos and whatnot. And he's commenting about the good, the bad, and the ugly on the aftermath of Hurricane Helene. And it's particularly the ugly and the solution sections that you guys should check out if you're amateur radio operators or care about this sort of thing. I'll leave the video in the descriptions for you to check it out. Now, in S2 Underground's video, he talks about people that have gotten on the air, the amateur radio frequencies, and have admonished those that don't have licenses and that we can collectively do better, which I agree. And I want to take this a step further, and I want to go look at the FCC rules specifically pertaining to emergency transmission. So now under the Code of Regulations, yep, I'll throw this link in the video description as well. If you go to... Uh, part 97 and you scroll down to providing emergency communication 97.401 through 407 there's a couple of parts in here that are of interest to us but if we scroll down to 403 safety of life and protection of property no provision of these rules prevents the use by an amateur station of any means of radio communication at its disposal to provide essential communication needs in connection with the immediate safety of human life and immediate protection of property we're not even talking about human life at this point just property when normal communication systems are not available I think it's this last sentence that people get stuck on. And I, I want to talk about that specifically. Normal communication, I'm assuming people think when they're in North Carolina or outside of this disaster area of Hurricane Helene as cell phones. Cell phones aren't working. The landlines aren't working. The internet isn't working. And it definitely wasn't working days after the initial disaster occurred. But I want you to go a step further. Even if the phones were there and the cell phones were available, who are they going to call? It's entirely possible that the people that are in the disaster or were, at least the days after the whole event happened, wouldn't know the phone number to call anyway, even if they had it. And then what would happen still if they get the phone number for a FEMA camp and they end up talking to somebody and they say, hey, yeah, no, you got to come five miles down the hill to get food, water, whatever it is you're looking for. For a lot of people, that's just not an option. That was just not going to happen. So hearkening back to 403, we're talking about the amateur here. If they're making communication, there's no provision that means you can't speak to somebody without a license. And when it comes to these kind of situations, I'm always reminded of this mental thought exercise where you ask yourself, is this the morally right thing to do? And does that matter more than it being the legally obligated thing to do? We can oftentimes be in the legal right, or in this case, the rules of the FCC right, but morally be in the wrong. And they could be vice versa. You could be morally in the right and legally in the wrong. And there are situations such as disasters where oftentimes the rules kind of go out the door. And if you spend your time worrying about the legal right thing to do when the morally right thing to do is right in front of you or right in front of your radio in the form of a person coming back through saying they need food, water, 
the ability to get out of a disaster area of a home that has collapsed upon them, then it's at least your obligation as a common fellow man to try and render aid there. So admonishing people over the air that you can't help them because they don't have a call sign feels like one of the scummiest human things you could possibly do. And particularly if you clutch to the to the pearls of the FCC rules while doing it, I think that's just moral gymnastics that you're trying to do inside your head to make it be okay that you're acting like this elitist or behaving in such a negative way to your fellow man. I uh, am I'm a bit deeper than I normally go in terms of my video content out here, but I was really bothered by some of the reports I heard. And having those reports be in such a juxtaposition to the fine, commendable work that so many amateur radio operators are doing in and around Asheville and many other disaster areas after Hurricane Helene. And and again, Florida just got hit with a hurricane, and we're going to have amateur radio operators trying to help out there as well. So it's incredibly frustrating when I oftentimes come out here in video form to speak on the good nature of amateur radio and how helpful amateur radio operators are, and then to hear situations where they're not only not being helpful, they're almost lording their ability to communicate as though having a license is some kind of a power that they have to not assist individuals that are in dire need of assistance. Now, of course, I wasn't there in these situations. I'm hearing, I'm hearing this third-party news from people like S2 Underground and other people who've gone to X and Facebook and, and numerous other places to talk about some of the difficulties they've had experiences with amateur radio operators. And that's really frustrating. And uh, I, I don't know what to say other than I think the people who are hearing me and agreeing what I'm saying are not the people that would behave this way in the first place. So... Maybe I'm just doing this to rant a little bit. But this also makes me think of another point that I think has been stewing for a while that I haven't commented on and I think needs to be said. Every hobby, every community has gatekeepers, fuds, sad hams, you name it, they have it. It's just a, a slice of humanity. It's the same amount of people statistically distributed that just happens to be into the same thing you're into. It just so turns out that unlike overlanding or camping, going outdoors, whatever, amateur radio has this ability to communicate these long distances in an ad hoc nature, which makes it uniquely successful in certain situations like we just experienced with Helene, where communication becomes so vital. But it doesn't change the, t the statistical breakup of the humanity of that group of amateur radio operators. There's still going to be jerks in those communities. There's still going to be the people that so many people call sad hams. The problem what I'm seeing, and so let's put those people on the side for a second. Bad actors, I, I agree. I think we all agree there. I think in the example of Helene, just help people out. In the example of Gilbert down in Florida right now, just help people out, right? But there's a flip side to this. There's the other side of the coin. Amateur radio is such a complex hobby. It's way more complex than GMRS, let's just say that. And to an extent, I also feel CB, although those guys, they do a bit more workshopping and garage tinkering than a lot of folks do. It's such a technical hobby that people that are new to the hobby and when they ask questions don't like the answers they get if it's not given to them in a way that's easy for them to digest, in a way that makes them feel like they're not really knowledgeable about the space, it seems that people have been leaping to calling the knowledgeable ones sad hams. I think this has now become a two-way road where the sad ham moniker has reached such a, a high level of noise floor that whenever someone says something that disagrees with any personal opinions on any topic related ham radio, or radio in general, those individuals are getting labeled sad hams. And I think the truth of the matter is, at least when it comes to internet arguing, is that there's usually a right and wrong party because to statistically and the scientific answer for a lot of these questions are black and white in many cases, that those individuals are just offended that they didn't know the answer or maybe were made to feel like they 
were not as intelligent as the other person, and so they immediately just knee-jerk to sad ham. And I'm not proposing any change to this. Obviously, again, the big point of this video is to talk about the emergency. I think it's all we just need to be a little bit more conscious of what this is all really about and that it's still a hobby. Yeah, it's still a hobby. Occasionally, it is a call to action for those that are willing to do so in the form of an emergency. But it's still just human beings. And unfortunately, human beings, at least some of them, suck from time to time. So if you're watching this and you've heard a horror story third party about emergency traffic in Helene or an individual who went to a club meeting and was made fun of or alluded to not knowing enough about something, that is just one of the smallest statistical sizes of groups in the amateur radio hobby versus the many people who care about you, their random fellow man, their random person who's interested in radio and is willing to help them out. As always, emergency situations, you may not be able to get the help you're looking for at the Ham Radio Crash Course Discord, but I promise you that if you come to the Facebook group or our Discord for the Ham Radio Crash Course, you're not going to be confronted with the quote-unquote sad hams, and we'll try to help you. Oftentimes, if you're not getting the answer you're looking for, or it's not given to you in the way you like it, go find that answer somewhere else. And I'm sure that for radio, there is somebody who's going to give you the information you're looking for. You're just going to have to be willing to not accept the negative attitudes, but maybe also try to take the comments and the feedback you're getting and try and understand what they're telling you because you might be surprised. It may not be given to you in the way you want to hear it, but it still might be the right answer. So there it is. Sorry for the uh, more heartfelt video than a lot of my stuff. I appreciate you guys watching. I really do. And, um, I have a hunch that a lot of these disasters are only going to grow in number, and we are going to still have to, regardless of what the tech bro enthusiasts tell you is going to be the death of amateur radio, that uh, Starlink is going to replace it or FirstNet is going to replace it. It's just not the case, even though Starlink, very successful. Good job. Still, amateur radio is one of the best ad hoc communication systems you can deploy in any kind of emergency situation, emergency or not, and be able to communicate with. You just need to know how to do it. And yes, it's not as simple as turning on a handy talkie, flipping to channel six and calling for help. There's more to it, but I promise you, if you put some time behind it and some effort, you can go a long way. I'm Josh, KI6NAZ. Thanks for watching. 73. Go ahead. Yeah, this is K4SWL on Long Branch Road in Swannanoa. Um, I'm not sure really who to direct this to, but we just had a group meeting up here. Uh, the upper part of Long Branch Road is probably going to be very isolated here soon. We've had significant deterioration of our uh, mountain road, and it's kind of crumbling away. And engineers are looking at it and stuff, but uh, we're probably very soon going to be cut off from everything. Um, we're currently having helicopter drops at the bottom of the road, which is two miles away and 1,000 feet of elevation lower than us. And it's really difficult for us to ferry items up because of the um, the road deteriorating. We can't we can't take ATV traffic across it even a whole lot anymore. So I don't know who is organizing or who to contact about this, and I can't really I'm not even in a position to contact them. But we wanted to see if one of the airdrops they're doing by helicopter could be done up on Upper Long Branch Road uh, so they can serve the community up here. Uh, do you have any clue who I would contact for that? Uh, I'll let Break go in case he has info. And additionally, I will add to that after the break. Go ahead. K4SWL, this is N4DIN. I will pass right along and we will try to get that changed. That's fantastic. I really appreciate it. We just had a community meeting because we have to decide if we're leaving here or staying here. Uh, it sounds like they're going to work on the road, and um, that sounds really positive, but there's a possibility it could just crumble away as well. And we're pretty resourceful up here. <laughs> we just we cleared, we cleared like a one-mile stretch of road, and I can't tell you how many driveways all on this uh, just a few short. Uh, we've got um, like 30 chainsaws and a bunch of people that know how to use them. And so I've been out all day long working and doing things most days along with everybody else in the neighborhood. Um, but it is really difficult to get down there when those helicopter drops happen because we don't know about them and there's nobody down there that can communicate it to us. So, yeah, if they could do that, there is a pasture up here, Joe Boyer's pasture, who 
They, um, I think they've already surveyed it and made sure that it was okay for a drop, and I think they've approved it. Um, so, yeah, uh, they should know probably where it is already. I copy you, and I will pass that along to um, the, the state, and we'll make sure that happens. Thank you, sir. I really appreciate it. And uh, this is K4SWL.